Hi, I'm Jim. Welcome back to my series on the fundamentals of lift for pilots. This is the second video. In the first video, we talked about how Newton's laws explain the low pressure on top of an airfoil, the high pressure on the bottom of the airfoil as a consequence of the deflection of the airflow around an airfoil. But we didn't talk much about Bernoulli, and most explanations of lift that you run into on the in popular media kind of jump right in with Bernoulli. So I probably left you with the question in your mind, what about Bernoulli? Well, let's answer that. First, what is Bernoulli's equation or Bernoulli's principle? Well, it's basically the conservation of energy. Now, I apologize for having an equation on the screen here, but it's kind of necessary when you're talking about Bernoulli's equation. There's three parts of this equation. One is static pressure and Pressure is a form of potential energy. If you have compressed air stored somewhere, you can use that to do work, or you have to do work to compress the air, so that's a potential energy. This term, density times velocity squared divided by two, is essentially kinetic energy, or the energy of motion. And what Bernoulli is telling us is that the sum of the potential energy and the kinetic energy is constant when you apply it to an ideal gas along a streamline without adding or removing energy from other sources. That's Bernoulli's principle. So to illustrate that, if we have a particle of air flowing along, you could think of it as a soap bubble if you want. As it moves, if it speeds up and goes faster somewhere, the pressure in that area is going to go down. And as it slows down, the pressure will go up along a streamline. If I add another streamline, Bernoulli's law tells me the relation between speed and pressure along that second streamline, but it doesn't tell me anything about the relationship between the pressure and the velocity here and the pressure and the velocity there, because potentially they could have different total pressures. That constant is known as a total pressure that could be different for both streamlines. And then me that means you can't use Bernoulli's equation to directly compare those streamlines. In this example, a number of streamlines. If all of these at some point in time and space have the same total pressure, the same constant, you know, they're all at about the same pressure, they're all at about the same velocity moving relative to some object like an airfoil here. If we start out with the same pressure and velocity, now we can start making comparisons and we can say that, that the pressure as, of this one as it goes over the airfoil is lower because the velocity is higher and the pressure down here is higher because the velocity is lower and we can make that comparison because we start out with everything at the same initial value for that constant in Bernoulli's equation. And this is one of the areas where Bernoulli is misunderstood and misapplied. For example, if let's look at the typical explanation or typical demonstration of Bernoulli's principle. We blow over a sheet of paper like this, creating a jet of air flowing along, and the paper moves up to meet that jet, and and our reaction is, yeah, Bernoulli, see? You know, well, no, our reaction should be, yeah, nonsense, see? Because we are violating the assumptions behind Bernoulli's principle. The pressure inside my mouth here, when I start blowing, is higher than the pressure out here. So my total pressure, the value of this constant, is different for the, for the air inside my mouth than it is for the air outside my mouth. And given that I have two different equations equal to two different constants, I can't just automatically say, well, this is faster. Therefore, the pressure is lower. I can't draw the conclusion that the pressure is lower in this stream than the pressure anywhere else around that stream because they don't have that same total pressure. Constants aren't the same. You can't use Bernoulli's equation to compare the two. What this really demonstrates, instead of Bernoulli's equation, let me draw my jet of bad breath here again, is that when you have a jet of air like this, this little blowing nozzle of air, it tends to entrain the air around it and transfer 
momentum transfer energy, which violates the principles that make Bernoulli's principle valid. And as it moves that air out of there, moves the air out of the space between the paper and that jet of, of air, then the paper is naturally drawn up into this lower pressure area that we've partially evacuated. And what this really demonstrates is that air has viscosity, which again is another violation of the limitations of Bernoulli's equation. This demonstration demonstrates air has velocity. It demonstrates that people don't understand Bernoulli's equation, but it does not demonstrate Bernoulli's equation. Now, if you want to understand the relationship between Bernoulli's equation and Newton's laws, you can derive Bernoulli's equation directly from Newton's laws, particularly the second law, using either calculus or in the case of the example shown here, I did it with algebra. There's There will be a link in the description to this video if you want to see that derivation. It takes a few minutes and a couple screens of algebra, but there's really no magic here. You know, There's nothing magic about Bernoulli that differentiates it from Newton's laws, because you can just go back and forth with a bit of math. So what is Bernoulli's law useful for? Well, one thing is you can use it to compare velocities and pressures, right? You can convert back and forth between velocity and pressure. If we go back to our equation, if we know that the sum of the potential energy from pressure and the kinetic energy from the velocity are constant, as we increase one, we decrease the other. That's what it's telling us. So in this case, this is a slide from the previous video where I explained how a airfoil generates lift and I did a simulation of this airfoil using X-foil, and that simulation gives me the pressures on the airfoil. The top surface has a lower pressure, the bottom surface has a higher pressure. The difference here is lift. And then I used Bernoulli's equation to directly calculate the relative velocities, higher on the top surface, lower on the bottom surface. Very useful for that purpose. But how do we use Bernoulli's equation to explain lift? Well, it doesn't directly explain lift, right? It just gives us this translation between pressures and speeds. If we want to use Bernoulli's equation to explain lift, we have to have an explanation that gives us the variation in speed, because Bernoulli doesn't do that. One legitimate way to explain the change in velocity so that we can apply Bernoulli's equation, is to look at circulation. This has been around as a theory for a long time. What circulation tells us is that there's a virtual or theoretical circulation of air around and around an airfoil. And then you add that to the airstream that would be going past that airflow naturally. And when you do the vector sum of those two flows, the, the linear airflow from motion and this virtual airflow from circulation, you get an airflow pattern that matches what happens in real life. And as you change the angle of attack, the amount of circulation has to change, and the lift is directly proportional to that circulation. Of course, this leads us to the question, where does that circulation come from and why does it happen? The short answer is it makes the math work. If we apply circulation around an airflow and superimpose that on the undisturbed airflow, we get the right answer here mathematically for the real airflow, the real velocities, and then we can use Bernoulli's equation to give us the pressures on top and bottom where on top this virtual airflow adds to the linear airflow so this is faster and on the bottom the virtual airflow essentially opposes or subtracts the linear airflow, gives us a slower pressure down underneath, and that gives us the high pressure under and the low pressure above, and that's lift. But as a simple, intuitive, feel-good explanation for a non-technical person, I think circulation doesn't cut it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Give me a comment if you think I'm wrong. It's just not the simple, easy explanation that you can give to a non-technical, non-math, non-STEM pilot. So what do we do? Well, this is the point where the wheels come off the bus. People have come up with explanations based on distances, 
based on it looks like a Venturi, based on streamline squeezing. The problem with these is they don't give you a realistic flow field or pressure field that matches real life. And if you try to use those so-called theories, such as the Venturi theory, anywhere beyond the simple, it feels good, it sounds plausible, even if it's totally wrong explanation, you come up with totally wrong conclusions. For example, what happens when you lower the flap on an airfoil? The Venturi theory tells us that this curve on the top results in a squeezing of the streamlines here, and that means that the air flow has to be faster there and we get a lower pressure there. Well, but if we look at the flap, as we lower the flap here, we get a lot of airflow or streamline squeezing underneath, right? It has to flow around that flap, just like it had to flow around that curved upper surface. So the Venturi theory, or streamline squeezing theory, would tell us that as we lower the flap, it decreases lift, which is the exact opposite of what happens in real life. You get these theories that predict the exact opposite of what really happens, you really have to question that theory, I think. Other things that go wrong, this is Einstein's airfoil here based on Bernoulli and simply Bernoulli, nothing beyond Bernoulli, where he put a hump there to squeeze the streamlines and lower the pressure in a hollow underneath to expand the streamlines and raise the pressure and get better lift. It didn't work. Um, Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower guy actually, who did a lot of early work, came, you know, attempted to test an airfoil that looked like that with multiple leading edges and multiple upper surfaces because that's where all the lift comes from. Uh, didn't work. These theories just don't cut it. Don't match real life. Is that important to a pilot? Probably not because we've got thousands and thousands of pilots out there flying airplanes quite successfully believing this nonsense about venturis and upper and lower surfaces and stuff. But in my opinion, as an educator, you should be giving people ideas that have some basis in reality, not fairy tales about distances and venturis. To summarize Bernoulli's principle, it's all about conservation of energy along a streamline, a single streamline. It only applies under specific conditions where we're not transferring energy in or out of that streamline, conditions that are violated when you do this kind of demonstration, which leads to me to the it is frequently misunderstood, misapplied, and abused. The bottom line is Bernoulli's principle or Bernoulli's equation is not in itself sufficient to explain lift. If you want to use it to explain lift, first you have to explain the velocity differences and again that's where the typical explanations completely fall apart, go off the rails, give you completely wrong answers and just don't work. So I hope you found that useful in some way, shape, or form or at least entertaining or thought-provoking. Next up we'll talk about airfoil shapes. We'll talk about mainly airfoils in X-foil, do some simulations where we look at the effects of camber and thickness distributions, and maybe a little bit about the history of airfoils and why they look the way they do. Again, I thank you for watching, and I'll catch you on the flip side.